Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And Dorothy, thank you for all of your thank you. So I'll keep mine brief. First, uh, thank you to all of you in the room and all of you who are attending uh, by live stream and Ramadan Mubarak to those who are celebrating. Um, and I also uh, want to thank both Dorothy Orville, Andrash, and the whole group for including me in this, in this program as the moderator. Uh, for the Phillips, this could not have happened without Nehemiah and Camille and Lauren and Victor, who are going to be running around making sure that all the tech works well. And I also really want to, want to emphasize the indispensable help I received from the Asia Society team, specifically Jeffrey Sikiris and also Rachel Rosada. Finally, Susan and uh, Nancy Stevens for inviting Americans to the Arts and myself to be part of this wonderful colonialist experience. We've talked about this project for years, so it's great to have it in my hometown. And I think it's also great to have this panel as part of the Phillips' long commitment to the Artists of Conscious series. And I'm sure we're all aware of the long history of the role that the arts and artists have played in galvanizing around activism. A powerful partner of our advocacy work at Americans for the Arts was the late great Congressman John Lewis, who often said to me, if it hadn't been for the music, the civil rights movement would have been like a bird without wings. So of course, there are powerful corollaries in the visual arts throughout history and throughout the world where artists have been the galvanizers of change. Personally, having been raised in New York City, my earliest visual memories were being taken to MoMA and being moved to the core by Picasso's drawings for Guernica and the painting itself, and seeing Sergei Eisenstein's film Battleship Potemkin when I was way too young to have been seeing a film like that. I was raised by parents who pretty much taught me how to march before they taught me how to walk. So I've always lived at that intersection between art and action. And so I'm especially grateful to be moderating a panel such as this and to Susan and Jeroen de Vries for this incredible exhibition that they have curated together and which all of you should see before it closes. I know everyone has emphasized that it's closing on April 22nd and I cannot recommend it highly enough. So I'm going to dash right into the panel starting with Susan and ask her to speak about the genesis of Colon Ice. But I first want to recognize what Dorothy already did, which is her incredible career, long career and decades long career as a highly acclaimed photographer. So she is an artist sitting here as a curator. So first and foremost, I want to talk to you about that shift and about your commitment to this particular project. So Susan. So I have the impossible task for those of you who have not yet been to colonize to give you an excitement to, to go. And I think um, in thinking about this, I, it's kind of a whirlwind tour. How fast can I move you through not my own artistic process, but the process of transformation that's led to colonize. So it begins with an invitation, very simple. Orville Schell, Dean of the Journalism School at Berkeley, invited me, a photographer, he a writer at the time, to go to, to, to make a visit to China. And the question was for me immediately, what would I have to offer? And it was clear to me that it was, I was not going to get into the mines as of the first image I saw. I couldn't even imagine how this man survived. And understand the deep history, which Orville did, of, of uh, China, which had heroized the coal worker. So we began looking at archives. We began to dig and find and see who we could find who were the Chinese photographers who had documented their own environment. That was sort of the initial impulse. Mm -hmm. Just moving through time has made me realize how our show has been adaptive to climate change itself transforming. And so the show, I wanted to show you this so you understand how dynamic this process is, not of making a show, but the world that we're living in. So this is 2006 is when we first went to China. By 2008, we put together a show called Mind in China. And we were totally focused on China, coal production in China. And I invited uh, Jeroen de Vries to co-curate with me and begin to design spaces, his signature being very aligned with photography and video. So we were beginning to see, and even in a very small space, smaller than this room, could we bring a feeling of what the issue was to a, a public setting which was PhotoFest in Houston in 2008. 
very quickly we realized if we had the invitation to bring the show to Beijing, we had to think more globally, more historically, and that led to the classic internet research, see who we could find. But our choice was to look for, I think I'm going to let go. Can you hear me without this better? Um, sorry. Look, look for authored, dedicated series of work. People, people making work, passionate about the work they made, not stock photography. So that, though that was the source to find the work that had greater depth. We very early on defined the riddle. The riddle was to provoke a question. What is the relationship in this title between coal and ice? And hopefully you see that and you don't answer it immediately, but we visually reveal it. And I think that's a key idea that also Orville recognized through his own experience, the connection between the coal production in Chaya, the impact on the Himalayas, the glaciers melting. And David Brashears became one of our you know, first, uh, you know, the, the amount of work that he had done, and this is now back to 2008. He was documenting off of historical photographs the melting of the glaciers, literally foot by foot. So when we bring it to Beijing, and this comes to a, a space called Three Shadows, it was the first building that Ai Weiwei designed, so it had a, its own history. Um, we're adapting space to what we're offered. And you know, trying to figure out, can we create something that's both what people are used to in looking at photographs and what they might not be, and they might begin to feel themselves in the midst of. I think this is also a really important juncture. This is where Clifford Ross's work comes in. You can see those waves, very large. I don't know how large, what were they? Six by eight feet or something? A series surrounding the other rivers that we knew to be impacted already by the glacier melt. So we're trying to create an environment that people begin to put the connections together. We're invited to a very small festival in a traditional setting in Bishan, a traditional village. Sadly, we installed the entire show beautifully in this setting, and the whole festival was closed down before it opened, just on the cusp of opening. We had another opportunity, and I think this, I, this is part of the message to you who are artists, to you who are institutions, and, and make choices all the time. We didn't have the choice of an institution. We had a property developer say, I've got an underground parking lot. Do you want to work with that in Shanghai, and we jumped on it. And so we transformed a parking lot into a space in Shanghai. Um, another opportunity came to us, and again, this is COP21, where 2015, the US ambassador's residence, the gardens, the interior, so we could invite a very different kind of conversation that was, of course, being had in the big tent in the center of Paris. We also thought about the periphery, who out on the outskirts of Paris, how do we involve people who are not in the tent, as it were, right, to bring them in. We partnered with a group called Disturb. Disturb is a group of photojournalists who feel that their work is no longer seen in magazines, so they bring it to the streets. So we invented a way in which you could text based on when you saw a poster like this, by texting in, you'd hear the photographer's voice as to what they had documented and the situation that they were, the, the image referred to. The next iteration becomes Fort Mason. And I'm emphasizing this because each iteration brings new ideas. This is at the time that Governor Brown has an international summit, September 2018. We took on the challenge of 50,000 square feet, which, you know, that's a lot. <laughs> it's bigger than a football field. So we developed a completely different, more immersive approach in this space. And I want to emphasize, you know, with limited text, really moving towards how do we unfold this story physically. So you see something that we created, which we call the cubicles, which are a constantly changing set of images. And in the darkness, you begin to have a different point of engagement. Clifford also, his genius was to take the idea of his waves, transform them into a digital installation, which also abstracted them, reinterpreted them, and created a kind of meditation in the space that we were working with. 
we had another idea. How do we create a forum, not like an auditorium here as we are, but right in the middle of the space? So invite people to have a conversation. Scientists, artists, entrepreneurs, the young and the old, they were performers. The idea was to engage an audience that might come to hear Al Gore, as they did last week, in the middle of our space and be surrounded by the images that people are referring to. We also had a very modest but an attempt at a solution zone. You see all those dots on the floor. Each one had a QR code, asked a question, invited the visitor to, to kind of think about the connections of possibilities. This is a small display by ITP, the NYU Graduate School of Design and Technology. They each created a display. This one is about regen regenerative uh, agriculture. So now here we are. We're here, we're in DC. As Orville likes to say, we're in the center of the center of the center. Um, and you know, we're still drawing on these diverse materials that span a very long time period. I find it fascinating to realize that we start with glass negatives from 1899. For those of you who really understand photography, they are the reference set of images that David Brashears takes to the Himalaya. So you actually see that relationship over 100 years. And we're also including smart mo uh, smartphone movies, which when we did the original exhibit, of course, we didn't have smartphones. So suddenly we have the opportunity of all these eyes on the world that are capturing and documenting their own realities. Um, I think a very important point is that it moves from the glass negatives to the smartphones to the images that are highly authored and anonymous Vimeo feeds, as you would see. So again, it's still focused on the lives of climate uh, of the miners throughout the world. It moves also into landscapes, polar ice, glaciers, hurricanes, floods. We move even through this found footage of which, I think, Orpal, you just referred to it as uh, dumpster diving, which is what it can feel like on the web. It's vast. This is actually self-representation of the corporations themselves documenting the, the world of mining as they see it in the US, in China, elsewhere. So again, the cubicle is something very special for us. We're sort of inviting people to move through, to stay, to see the sight lines of other cubicles and the relationships between, but it's very intuitive. As I think Andras just said, it's very visceral. And I think that the the, the goal is to create this kind of uh, engagement through really the physical expression, the navigation through, of course, some ideas, renewable energy, we read about it. You see the vastness of it. And I think you have to see it in, in a layered relationship to the crisis that's also surrounding us. So what you see here is just a glimpse. I just made this about an hour ago. You see the drowning people from various parts of the world, Bangladesh, the UK. Uh, in the background, you see Jamie Stilling's work pointing to vast solar fields. So I think when, when you think about public engagement, how do we bring new audiences in um, to the tent, literally, to be in dialogue? Um, we developed a new tool for this specific um, installation, which I think was an amazing experiment. It's called a posturator, which invites the public, wherever they are, to download images and add their own messaging, which is what you see on the left. And then, of course, is a reference desk the way any good museum would give you all the context that you want if you want to dig deeper. So, you know, I think we think of this show as it's not fixed. It's got to be flexible. It responds as we all need to respond. And I guess I would just, um, I think it's kind of a beautiful, what you see on the right comes after you see all of what Jamie has presented as the future and the hopefulness, solar, wind. And as you can see, it, it says, we spoke, we witnessed with voices and hands. We can't say that we weren't present. So that's, that's the ambition of the show, to bring more of you in to the tent and hopefully expand beyond. So thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, next up is Clifford. And Clifford's been part of Coal and Ice from its inception with installations in Beijing, Shanghai, Paris, and San Francisco. 
and you've also been uh, engaged in a number of global issues as an advocate for change, both as a citizen and as uh, in your role at the Frankenthaler Foundation. So uh, can you talk about your work a bit and your process? Thanks so much, Nora. So which, uh, I realized with the opportunity of having the three award winners here in a way, I'm one artist who's been, I hope, doing what you're already starting to do. It took me a while to get there. And um, you have to forgive my sort of oblique start to this, but um, I've never been just straight ahead with what I do, and I don't tweet. But um, I was sent by a young, very active environmentalist the following uh, tweet by a guy named David Sirota, I don't know. And he apparently tweeted this um, during or just after the Oscar broadcast. My thoughts on the Oscar slap incident are that it's 70 degrees in Antarctica and what's left of the livable ecosystem is being destroyed. So we should focus on that. That's not to diminish the issues of what happened at the Oscars, but I just thought it was an extraordinary kind of rebuke to how we think and in line with what Orville had said earlier, that with everything that's going on, we really need to pay attention. Um, <laughs> the temperature assessment, I guess, was a little bit off, but um, we'll forgive him that. Um, I'm going to use another crisis to really underscore the power of art. Uh, this picture is from the National Museum of Lviv, uh, National Museum of, of Ukraine in Lviv. And if ever we needed to see an example of why art means something to our cause, the people in this room and that are tuning in, it's this picture. At a moment of incredible crisis with death all around them, curators, art handlers, and so on are working to save what? The very things that we artists try to make. Um, art's powerful. Um, it illuminates the here and now. Um, and it chronicles the present for the future, which is really, really important. So all the photographers that Susan has been including and her, the work that she has done, um, these are things that people are going to learn from in the future. So the thought that art is, it could be a passive bystander here um, is um, one which I would reject. Uh, we can be as activist as we're allowed. Um, I think that art, it really holds humanity um, sort of responsible to itself. Um, I found these images which I just thought were stunning. Um, I don't know Eeyore Kazan, uh, but if you look at him and his stance and his face, it's both heartbreaking and I think um, really demonstrative of the value of this art making process. In that colonized tent, you see it. And here um, is certainly ample proof. Um, at the Frankenthaler Foundation, actually next week, we're gonna be, um, we're gonna be announcing a, a support for artists and art heroes uh, like Eeyore, um, which we're gonna be um, really deep into. Um, anyway, I'd like to turn now to my work at, uh, at the Colonized Project over the years. Um, and uh, this was an installation, Susan made reference to it, uh, at Colonize San Francisco. It's just a one minute video.
So with Nora's requesting uh, a comment or two about what I do and how I do it, the purpose behind this was to make evident the power and the beauty, frankly, of the ocean. I built a piece of ocean um, in my studio. Um, I'd been photographing hurricane waves for at least two decades. And the one thing my photographs couldn't do was move. And I could never uh, produce a, a true video uh, with a camera in any way that worked. I failed over and over. And we spent about three years figuring out how to build a piece of ocean digitally. And you can just see that uh, felt one of the fellows that worked with me um, is facing a, a bunch of studies that I had done. And uh, with coal and ice, it had a really central purpose, and that was to underscore at an emotional level uh, the struggle which Susan and, and Orville were trying to make evident through the, the previous part of the exhibition. Um, and um, the, the process of doing it for me, as you could probably tell, I stumble even with this computer and this, but I, I try to work with smart people, and building that piece of ocean was a joy. Um, Hollywood uses similar uh, software to do it. Um, we broke it apart and rebuilt it. Um, we were moving, it's just sort of a fun fact, 3.2 million particles in space, and uh, perfect storm, that, that uh, Clooney movie. I think they were moving 300,000 to make their ocean. So we're proud of what we do technically, but the point of it is to build something, make something which is emotional. You've seen this uh, already in Susan's uh, presentation. Um, I'd never printed on canvas before. I'd never put canvas on an aluminum sheet before. But one of the things that artists need to pay attention to are the opportunities to display images all the different ways. It's not just about printing on paper. It's not just about uh, certainly our iPhones and our computers. And this was an amazing opportunity that I felt was a gift uh, to work with everybody on this. And I've certainly never overlapped images, which turned out to be a joy. And one of the things that's stunning about the opportunities that are given to an artist is the potential to pull people in intimately. Uh, I do often work very large, but part of my goal, it's amazing being here at the Phillips because there's a room upstairs, I'm sure most of you have seen it, the famous Rothko room. And Rothko wanted his work, as large as it could ever get, to be an intimate experience. He used that word over and over. And so even when working large for the, the, the we, we move in space, we should be allowed to move in space and experience uh, what the art uh, is doing for us and to us. I'm just going to show a few of the images uh, that I have made uh, over the years. I photographed one patch of, of beach. Uh, it's out in Long Island. Um, I was going to travel the world in a big romantic idea uh, and find waves all over. But it turned out I had a deep attachment to about a quarter mile of beach. And that's pretty much where I've done everything. Um, I shot this uh, just uh, last September, and I have not stopped. Uh, as you can see, some of these are quite, quite threatening, um, and I'm not sure how it is I escaped this one, uh, but I am here, so. But they go from the super powerful to the lyric, uh, from light to dark, and uh, nature, when it's allowed to perform without interference, uh, is a wondrous thing. This was also from this past hurricane season. And um, I'm going to talk briefly in a minute about how this work has had me evolve. And there's no question I could not have made a photograph like this earlier, not just because of technical things, but my vision of the world is changing because of the world we know we're living in. And this almost apocalyptic scene uh, would not have been part of my vision earlier. Uh, I'm just going to give another one minute uh, little video of uh, how I make these things.
So uh, this was a very uh, early photograph in the series. Um, I think I shot the picture around 98. And it was an extremely dark afternoon. And I, I was shooting film at the time. And my impression of what the scene was in front of me was it's quite vivid, which was I was dealing with a black sky and a white sea. And my job as an artist is to bring to you as the viewer um, my experience and any feelings I have about that scene. And I didn't know it at the time, uh, what was going on, but I certainly pushed the image in a direction that I never would have imagined uh, while I worked in the dark room. But it is a pretty accurate interpretation of my memory of the scene. Um, some years after I printed this as a silver gelatin print, um, I was tired of the perfect window of, of uh, photography. I had been a painter for 20 years before, and I began experimenting with a new technique, which was inkjet printing. And what I found was that if I used handmade paper, the ink would be pulled into it. And the interpretation of this same image with new tools, new materials, enabled an even darker interpretation. I had absolutely no conscious intention of making a statement about the environment or climate change. But somewhere subconsciously, which is where a lot of activity takes place for an artist, I think it was in there. And um, it just, when I was preparing for today, I sort of suddenly thought, my god, look what happened back 20 plus years ago in my understanding of what I was photographing. Um, I've had a sort of a wonderful beginning dialogue with Dorothy and the museum here about possibilities about a stairwell. So um, I thought I would drop this in. Um, this is, uh, the installation was just being done of a very large scale print, wildly oversized. And um, I sometimes make work that's two by three inches. I often go very large. Um, and what's interesting to me is the immersive experience, something which the coal and ice experience uh, gives all the viewers. Um, and getting, walking upstairs next to a very large image is a, an amazing <laughs> experience. I can't help laughing at it because um, I never really thought in life I'd get to do things like this. And uh, this is an exhibition <clears throat> that was held at the Parish Art Museum. And they uh, enabled me to work with uh, their main galleries. And I had this idea of not only going large, but making the waves physical by printing them on wood. So the experience of these was really, again, one more attempt to give you a feeling uh, for the ocean. And there is something about these images um, which has changed. Um, and I can't say I am the conscious a developer of that change. So I want to just read something for a moment. Um, Orville, um, who with Susan really built coal and ice, wrote the following about my work back in 2014 for a museum catalog. <clears throat> he wrote, I came to experience something else, something rather unexpected. I saw not just nature's inexhaustible beauty, but the derangement of this beauty brought about by man himself. The hurricane waves are at once images of sublime natural beauty and emblems of man's perverse power to destroy the very fabric of life that sustains us. And I remember, Orville, when you, we were sitting in the kitchen and you were sort of interviewing me and recording it, and I was brought up short by the probing questions. And Orville's had a, a long, uh, a long time uh, understanding of what's happening in our natural world. And he sort of broke through by asking me questions for me to understand some of what I was doing. And I just want to, I put together just a short paragraph thinking about today, because I feel it's sort of um, a, a moment that, uh, well, it made me pensive on the flight here. I've got no problem with the fact that people view my images differently than how I intended. I can embrace that. That's the life of art. Maybe I was subconsciously making commentary as I reached for the sublime, or maybe I was duped by my own blindness. 
I wasn't just photographing nature, but nature, however subtly, transformed by our disregard for this planet. Anyway, I can't photograph nature like they did in the 19th century. How terrible. I can almost say that nature has become man-made. Can we possibly work together to head back just in the direction of Eden? Thanks. Thank you. Well, we've heard from two remarkable artists and curator. Um, now we're going to talk policy and politics. So I want to welcome Felice to the stage and, and as an advocate and a policy uh, professional in the environmental realm, I'd love to hear you talk about your current climate change priorities and also more personally about the role that the arts and artists intersect with the work that you do and the way that you do it. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to be here today. The perspective I bring today is that of a policy advocate who has spent 25 years in the nation's capital pushing the federal government to reduce pollution, make our communities healthier, and make our economy, move our economy to clean energy. But today I'm here wearing two hats. One is I represent the Environmental Defense Fund, a global organization that's working to secure a climate safe and a vital earth for everyone. And second, as an activist who grew up with art, cares deeply about the natural world and protecting the environment, and who's, who's leveraged art for climate action. And I'm really excited to uh, be in the company of so many wonderful artists. I'm gonna start a little bit about what brought me to even being on the stage, and, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we've used art in climate advocacy. First of all, there's no question that my formative years have had an influence on my particular interest and commitment to infusing art into my advocacy as a way to reach people and to spur them to join our cause. I grew up in New York, went to college in the city, and was surrounded by art and politics and peers committed to social change. Of course, I would be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge the strong influence of my late mother, an artist who worked primarily on canvas, painting, in her words, all those things I cannot address with reason or rationale. My shift to working on environmental causes came about as I learned and saw up close the incredible scars and pollution we were making on the landscape. Books like these two opened my eyes to the scale of the problem and the enormity of the challenge ahead to tackle environmental degradation. For an activist, though, it's not enough to just point out the problem or to just raise awareness. That's just the first step. The question becomes, how do we integrate art as a persuasion tool to push for social change in a way that can grab and hold people's attention, inspire engagement, and create a connection to our message? So there's many different ways that this can look. But today, I'm going to briefly speak about three as an intentional way to raise awareness, as protest art, and as a particular way of building our movement. On the first, I've helped conceive of national art contests uh, that were specifically designed as public awareness campaigns, but targeting members of our organizations rather than the professional arts community. With the Environmental Defense Fund, last year, we launched the inaugural, quote, Go Bold Art Contest. It was a call to action for EDF members where we asked them how they viewed the world if we move to 100% clean energy. We received over 70 submissions from across the country, artists ranging from children to teenagers to artists in their 80s. It illustrated for us how intergenerational art is as an important medium to share our stories, hopes, and even fears. 
we chose 10 final works of art, and then we published them in our fall 2021 Solutions Magazine, and then shared them widely with our million, art, um, million members through digital means and all of our platforms. On the second example, when it comes to protest art, there is no question there is so much out there. And so I really had to think about what I wanted to bring as an example. So I bring one where we brought art literally to the steps of lawmakers in a campaign that many of us were a part of for years on the Keystone XL pipeline. You might recall this pipeline was intended to open up vast new markets of very carbon intensive tar sands oil in the boreal forest of Alberta, Canada, and bringing this heavy crude to refineries. It's a very blurry picture, I apologize. Um, this heavy crude uh, to down to the refineries on the Gulf Coast, uh, then to, um, to be shipped to Asian markets. This is a campaign, again, that's struck, struck, uh, stretched out for many years. So this is a story about the artist Frankie James. Frankie James was a little-known artist who found herself targeted by the Canadian government for making art that criticized the expansion of tar sands. Well, this only further emboldened James, and she began producing works of art critical of the government's climate and environmental record. She became one of Canada's most outspoken environmental activists. James wanted to explore a creative way to do an art installation in Washington, D.C. that would bring her art pieces to the decision makers for this, pre for this project. That was President Obama and his State Department. So we raised the money and did an installation of bus shelters around the Capitol um, and, uh, and the White House. The installation generated press, galvanized the, uh, the public, and definitely got the, uh, the, caught the attention of decision makers. It was a really fun project. And by the way, President Obama did put an end to the Keystone XL project uh, before he left office, then was reversed by President Trump, and then re by President Biden early in his presidency. Lastly, with respect to building our movement through art, I want to share a project from a partner of ours, uh, and the partner's uh, name is Poder Latinx. You can find them on the website. This is an inspiring group show that they did on the power of voting, which they released in 2020 before the November elections. The show featured 15 artists whose works were displayed in a virtual art gallery. Poder Latinx's mission is to engage young Latinos on democracy, climate change, and social justice. They conceived of this art uh, art gallery project as a creative and innovative approach for exploring ways to be civically engaged. Their primary goal was to reinforce how critically important it is for young people to vote. The virtual art gallery was part of a year-long campaign that Poder Latinx ran that included voter registration and education and culminated in a major get out the vote initiative on election day. As I said, you can go on their website and you can still look at this um, art, art exhibit. So I'm going to close and leave with you with two considerations. For advocates out there, for advocates listening, look for opportunities to invite and infuse art as a way to inspire members of the public to join our causes, to generate enthusiasm and excitement for the visions we're working toward. But remember, it's not enough to just point out the problem. We need to instill hope and empower one another to be part of the solution. And as artists, use your platform. You have a platform to reach and motivate people to be a force for change. And again, I'm really excited to be in the company of so many artists who are doing just that today. The relationships we hold, the access we have 
to people in positions of influence can be incredibly powerful, powerful tools, and we should not underestimate those. Use social media. I know you don't tweet, but I know you're on social media. Join or volunteer with a local environmental or conservation organization. There is inspiring work happening in communities across the country and globe. But lastly, this is our moment, not for despair, but for seizing on the solutions right before us to tackle the world's greatest environmental threats. So th thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, Felice. And I, I want to thank our next speaker, Congressman Don Beyer from Virginia, who joined us today. And thank you for making the time. I know you're in the midst of a reelection uh, campaign. So to make moments for this is we really appreciate it. I just want to do a brief introduction and let people know that you're a longtime champion of environmental converse, conservation policy and have a 100% rating from the League of Conservation Voters. I also want to acknowledge that the arts are very important to you as well, and that you're a member of the Congressional Arts Caucus, which is a group that Americans of the Arts works with often. So we're hoping that you will talk about some of the environmental issues that you're currently focused on, and how you feel that artists and the arts can be the best partners uh, uh, for changing policy. So thank you, and thank welcome. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I mostly just care about what my score is with the Environmental Defense Fund, um, but I'll check with Felice later. Uh, thanks for inviting me here. Uh, I'm honored to be with these incredible people, and I've really enjoyed the, the presentations, and I confess I'm the resident Philistine on the panel. Um, I guess it wouldn't be a true D.C. event without a member of Congress, so I will do my best to be worthy of the stage. Um, I represent the part of Virginia right across the, the, the river inside the Beltway. Which is relevant because the biggest way we see climate change is the flooding that affects Alexandria is the number one political issue there right now. Um, but we're here to talk about the power of the art, the role of art in social movements, particularly surrounding climate change. But it's, let's just start with the idea that art is very political and it has an enormous impact throughout the ages. I was just thinking of just some of the examples are the the work that photographers played in elevating the civil rights struggle. We all know the pictures of John Lewis getting beat up crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge or the, the, the vicious police dogs attacking the kids in the South, the, the little girl being escorted by the National Guard to her school. Um, I got to sit in front of John Lewis for a couple of years on Ways and Means, one of the most lovely men. Um, but there would not have been, I don't think, the kind of civil rights movement that we had without people telling that story through art to the rest of the country, to people who didn't live in the Deep South. We're seeing it now today with um, the Ukraine. Without the images coming from Kiev, from Mariupol, from Zartsov, I don't know that we care nearly as much as we do right now. Um, I spent a lot of time with the Ethiopian diaspora, for example. In contrast, where at least some estimates are more than 200,000 of uh, the Ethiopians in the north have died of famine in the last year. And uh, we're not paying attention to it because the art, the story, hasn't been told to, to any of us. Um, the same is true for climate change. But art is helping to shape and drive that narrative. Um, I, you know, I, I think the, for me the best example was Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth, um, including as, as long as we're going to make sure that film um, are, are, is in uh, the art that we talk about. Uh, I know for me at least that was what moved my concern from uh, nuclear war to climate change. And I think for, this is true for many, many, many people. Oscar Wilde's 19, 1889 essay, The Decay of Lying, one of his characters makes a famous claim that life imitates art far more than art imitates life. Um, I'm not quite sure that's true, but it is true to all life and certainly all politics and all persuasion and I hope I'm not going too far to say that all art is storytelling. I certainly know that when my wife and I go to a gallery, every painting that I look at, or photograph, or sculpture, I'm trying to figure out what the story is, and how that story affects me emotionally, how that story affects me intellectually. I've been very lucky that when I ran for office first time for Congress eight years ago, 
you know, you need to have just a simple story. And my simple story from the heart was that I want to be the strongest, clearest voice to combat climate change that I could be. And I've been very privileged. I represent the most educated and certainly the most politically sophisticated congressional district in the country, so I can get away with it. Um, but there are many other people who don't. On a hopeful note, when I showed up there eight years ago, I got to be on the science committee. Um, a science nerd, so this was perfect. Um, but unfortunately, we were led by a Texas Republican, a friend, but a uh, complete climate change denier. And so the committee was split between those who said climate change isn't real and those who said this is the most important thing that we have. Um, over the years, they've, they've moved a little bit. First it was it isn't real, it's fake, it's a hoax, it's climate, China. Then they moved to it's real, but it, men, mankind didn't cause it, to it's real and mankind may have caused it, to where they are basically right now, which is it's real, we caused it, but there's nothing we can do about it. Um, so, but the good news is that I have many, many Republican friends now who will all agree that climate change is real. And that's huge movement in 10 years. Um, part of that is because it has affected their district so much. Uh, one of my friends is a Republican from Myrtle Beach who talks about how um, 300 year storms in three years has pretty much convinced him that something is different, that something is wrong, and that he needs to pay attention to it. By the way, the, there still are the people that completely deny it, but they tend to be um, coming from three different places, or two and a half. One is they, they come from an oil patch. So you come from central Texas, um, for you it's just impossible to admit climate change is real, or, or, or the coal fields of West Virginia or Wyoming. Or there's the QAnon people um, who just think everything is a conspiracy. Um, and then the, the second half of the deal is those that are concerned about the displacement of jobs, which is very real. Uh, I had statewide office in Virginia for eight years, and I love my coal mining friends. And back in the late 80s, early 90s, we weren't no worried about climate change. We didn't really know about it. But now they're all out of work. Uh, they, there's, there are no coal jobs left. And we have done, as a people, as a country, a terrible job at taking care of those displaced either by trade, by the by manufacturing technology and by climate change. Um, and you know, the, the, the policy slang is trade adjustment assistance, um, but we just haven't done a good job at figuring out what do you do with a 55-year-old coal miner in Abingdon, Virginia, who can't do coal anymore um, because we don't need it and we've closed the coal plants. A challenge to come. Um, it also, one of the great challenges is that people, with the exception of our kids, our people are not voting on climate change. You know, they'll care much more about drug pricing, as they should, um, than about climate change. They'll care right now much more about gas prices. Um, what I hear every day is it's 450 or 425 or 505, um, not what's happening around the world in terms of climate. When they go back down again, um, it's going to be even worse. So I think our job in politics and in arts is to be the storytellers, to tell people what's going on and to help change their minds. And like you know, brush strokes on the canvas, you almost have to do it one stroke at a time. So let me break it into two pieces. Number one is the description of the problem itself, with your wonderful art and with coal and ice, is to see what it's looking like. Um, I chair, co-chair the Safe Climate Caucus, and one of the things we do is a newsletter every single week that just talks about what we've discovered about climate change in the previous week. And it's overwhelming every single day. You just pick up New York Times, Washington Post from the ocean acidification and the way it's affecting our shellfish and destroying our coral reefs. The drought that's affecting the West right now, essentially, but all over, over the world, which actually drove the Syrian um, migration and the Syrian wars. The flooding, um, I hope none of you live in Hampton Roads, but uh, the folks who live in Norfolk and Virginia Beach have to check the radio and the television every morning to see which way they can go to work, to see what's flooded today. Uh, big concern for the Navy. Um, the rainstorms. Um, the big, biggest challenge in Alexandria is not the river rising. It's the fact that these 100-year rainstorms come two and three times a summer and overwhelm all of the storm water sewers systems that we had before. Uh, I was praising the tulips on the Capitol grounds yesterday to my wife, who pointed out that the Netherlands is now importing tulips from southern France because theirs are not growing so well in the warmer north climate 
uh, of Netherlands, um, and on and on and on. Um, it's so many different things. Every single day, there's a new big piece that comes about. So we have to teach people as best we can. I mentioned that it's harder with the people that vote. Um, one of my great optimist, pieces of optimism is that young people get it. Um, virtually anybody I know under the age of 30 or 35 understands that climate change is the central issue for their generation. Um, if we just get them to vote, we'd be in better shape. But, but let me pivot to the second half of the story, which, as, as Felice said, is, is about the optimism and the hope, because there's a lot of very good things going on out there. First of all, it's not just the federal government, as slow and glacial as we can be. Uh, state governments, um, especially big state governments, California, New York, Massachusetts, um, Virginia, sometimes, mostly, Maryland, Illinois, are all doing really important climate work. And that moves us in the right direction. Corporations, too. Um, businesses everywhere are thinking about packaging, about shipping, uh, about the climate commitments they make to attract employees. I know my kids would only want to work for a company that is good on the environment. And then there's the, the federal government. So let me give you some, some optimism there, too. I went to Glasgow um, for the COP26. And the, the most interesting thing I saw was the meeting with the folks on the peat reserves all around the world, which I had never even thought about. It's incredibly important. But the best time was an hour and a half with John Kerry, who is as masterful as I've ever seen him, talking about the initial COP26 idea, which was uh, keep 1.5 alive. 1.5 degrees centigrade between 1900 and 2050 was the goal of the current COP26. John Kerry said at the end, based on the commitments we had, and if we keep our own commitments, we'll be at 1.7 degrees centigrade by 2050. So that doesn't make it. We're off by two tenths of a degree. But we also have 30, 28 years to figure out how to come up with those other two tenths. What's in that? Well, coastal resilience bills, which pass the House every single year. Um, we were able to get successfully sea fuel bills into the defense authorization. So those are funded, which is literally taking carbon out of the seawater and using it to power ships. Um, NASA will fly two aircraft this year that will be electric. Um, that, first of all, if you live on a flight path, this is a really good thing. Um, but also a very good thing is you move away from dropping uh, all that fuel. And the rest of the industry is moving to what they call SAF, which is a, a Special Aircraft Fuels, SAF which are recyclable um, fossil fuels, you know, think wood chips and the like. Um, and that's coming in a major way by the end of this year. Um, the infrastructure bill, which we already passed on a bipartisan basis, funds 500,000 charging stations across the country for electric vehicles. So we get over what's called range anxiety, a, a new invention. Uh, and then in the Build Back Better bill, which we have yet to pass, but we're still very hopeful, that at least a major chunk of it, including the environmental provisions, will pass before the end of July, has enormous credits for basically the, the electrification of transportation and of automobility, which is 25% uh, of all uh, emissions. So $12,500 credit for buying an electric car, which is a great down payment, by the way. 35% um, tax credit for all commercial vehicles. So big trucks, vans, the trucks that you drive day in and day out. Permanent tax credits for solar and wind and geothermal and other alternatives. Big investments for battery research. Big investments for, for hydrogen. The one thing it doesn't do, which virtually every economist across the political spectrum thinks is smart and necessary, is carbon pricing. It's made carbon a lot more expensive. I lived in Switzerland for four years, leaving nine years ago. And when I left, the price for a gallon of gas in Switzerland was eight bucks. Um, and that was just the price of gas. That not accidentally, a lot of them walk to work, they ride the bike to work. Uh, they're the number one train riders in the world um, because of that. Um, and then the most exciting thing for me is um, for a couple of, year, couple of years ago, I started the Fusion Caucus, Fusion Energy Caucus. Um, fusion is the energy of the sun, of all the stars in the, in the universe, putting two little hydrogen atoms together to create helium and throwing off uh, energy. No radioactive waste. Runs on seawater. But all of our lives, it's been 25 to 50 years away. Every year, it stays that far away. But now, there have been so many other changes in, in science that this is actually real. Real, like in the next 10 years or the next 15 years at the worst. Um, I'm still having trouble overcoming skepticism, which is why I'm offering it here to you today. Look it up. 
Um, we had the first White House summit on fusion energy on March 17th. So with, with all the big players, um, and th the reason this is important for all of this is when we can move to fusion energy, seawater, rock, and no radioactive waste, we don't ever need to use any more fossil fuel. When we will be able to power all the electric vehicles on the road. We will be able to do one of the most important things, which is something called direct air capture, which is taking carbon out of the atmosphere. The IPCC, which is the big UN scientists, the ones who've done all the climate change work, say we need to take 50 billion tons of carbon out of the atmosphere by 2050 to take us back to where we want to be, and another 50 by the end of the decade. The only way to do that is with something like fusion energy. You can't burn fossil fuel to take carbon out of the air. You need to do something entirely different. So there's a lot of reason to be hopeful and optimistic and, um, and a lot of opportunity and responsibility for you and for me. For me to try to ultimately get the votes to pass a lot of these things, and for you to tell the story about what's wrong and why we should be concerned about it, and the hopeful story that we're not helpless, that there are many, many great policy solutions as long as we advocate for them and make it happen, which is what I want to end with. Is that the last story is that ultimately political leaders are the ones that decides who has a job and who doesn't, who has a home and who doesn't, who has a good income and who doesn't, who goes to war and who doesn't, and whether we have the kind of environmental policies that will save our planet. So please elect people who care about this. I don't care what party they're in, as long as, you know, the bottom line is not the R, or the D, or the I, it's whether they care about climate change and are willing to make that difference. So thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman, and thank you to all of our incredible panelists. Can I get one more round of applause for the group? And, and thank you, Congressman, also for creating a perfect segue. We, we're going to talk about the future uh, and the young generation whose responsibility it will be to carry the torch uh, for the work in climate change. So I want to welcome uh, to the stage uh, the three winners for the uh, Frankenthaler uh, Climate Art Awards, and we're going to watch their, well, I guess maybe don't come to the stage quite yet because we're going to watch your films first, but I want to congratulate again uh, Douglas Tolman, who we'll, we'll see his film first, Maurizio Chavez, and Alexa Velez. Uh, so we'll watch the films, and then you'll join us on stage, and we'll have a Q&A for everyone at the very end. So um, enjoy the view.
te viste que es esa tienda que voy y tienda que hay y de esa so many tragedies engendered by the triple sin it might seem trivial to one street lights not to outshine the night sky but far beyond separating us from the stars the circles of artificial light disrupts entire ecosystems this extension of day into night causes disturbances that affect both animals and humans Brazilia, the prototype of modern city, emerged already illuminated. At Coyabu Durubu, a rural neighborhood just some miles away from downtown, I met the night. This happened when I needed to distance myself from the city to focus on my master's degree. This move on my part was not an attempt to seek an idyllic refuge. Nonetheless, watching the city from above, I could see its elements from a different perspective. In spite of being surrounded by century-old savanna trees and a waterfall that remains crystalline, the city announces itself everywhere, spreading its traces through lampos, garbage and barbed wire fences that vie for territory with termite mounds and that shows Urubu as a hybrid landscape, a nature that will be increasingly confused with any other parts of the city. In this short video essay, I want to highlight three works that I made during the period I lived there that directly address the light pollution subject. These works culminate in my first solo exhibition, Pyramid Urubu. For the short film Juca, I invited neighbors whom I used to ride with during the night to be the actors. While shooting, we repeated the adventures that we had as rituals for the camera. In 2017, the first light poles were installed in the neighborhood, changing the experience of riding with my friends. Once I read an article that said that the main tool of the contemporary amateur astrologer would no longer be the telescope but the car, which can take you away from the light that impairs the view of the sky. In our case, it was the bike. This is the plot of Juca. A group of friends must find somewhere dark enough to watch an announced meteor shower. Beyond Juca, the other works that I produced there were also connected with Urubu. Keeping this in mind, while planning for my first exhibition, I needed to develop expographic strategies to integrate the place from where these works emerge and the city's luminous horizon. I couldn't see this happening inside a white cube gallery, which usually separates artworks from the outside world. To me, it was very important for the audience to experience the projections while breathing the dust walking among trees and tripping over rocks. That's why Pyramid Urubu premiered as an open-air event. In collective abduction bathing in full moon, a flutist guided the audience to the Urubu waterfall to bathe under a blue light cone that appeared floating on the water. The public was then able to join in and create a new rules for the fictional situation. They line up to enter the light circle, got a smoky blessing and dive into the water like a baptism. On the second tour, the attendees needed to hike a hill. Arriving at the top, they would find the installation Pyramid Cinema. People lay down on the floor and looked up to see the projection playing out above them. The light from the projector interspersed with moonlight, expanding the mixed reality performance. The film Juca, screened in its real-time version, was extended in length and its scenes were recombined by me alongside the musician Romero Galas. Pyramid Urubu reached its final form when it debuted at the Brasilia Digital TV Tower, a monument built at the top of the hill. The glass dome galleries allowed the city lights to get in, as well as for moonlight to blend with the exposed works.
and another king wave this week. Authorities advise all citizens to conserve power for the next few days. Please enjoy the next hour of that. Please join me in welcoming Mauricio, Alexa, and Doug to the stage. Congratulations again. On, on this award, and I wonder if you each want to take a, a very brief moment to just talk about the, uh, the inspiration for your piece. Hi. Thank you all for this. Uh, it's, it feels really great. Uh, 
Um, well, but responding to the question. Um, um, well, I, I would say that I was, um, how I come to this team like of light pollution, I don't know, maybe I was trying to run away of image itself and uh, visuality or, uh, or even this idea of inviting the audience to see um, or to behave in a different way towards image was like to challenge them to sharp the eyes to see something that is in a different frequency, usually not accessible. So I was just I was just experiencing this by myself, like being in this world that is more and more illuminated. Um, I was just noticing that I was not being able to see that far uh, because of the surplus of light. So. Uh, I would say that the, the the light pollution is like taken away the of us this experience of seeing far and to feel like um, to feel like small towards something bigger. Maybe I don't know. If it's bringing us to see closer and closer. So by trying with my friends there in this region in Brazil uh, to look for a place dark enough with them was something that keep the shape of the work uh, in general because we were like they inspired me to invite the audience to that uh, and also I remember that I uh, being there like in the self-imposed res uh, residency because I moved to a place, a place, a darker neighborhood in Brasilia um, to do this research that is important to say was born in my first master degree uh, at the University of Brasilia. Um, I moved to this place to met the night as I said in the video. Um, and um, uh, I just remember that I was like, okay, at some point, is it going to culminate in a show? And I was thinking how to make this sort of an experience that relates directly to, to something that I'm talking about instead of just putting this into a white cube. So I just figured out the, that the digital TV tower there at the top of the same hill I was living in has the stone galleries that allowed me to compose with the city, city luminous horizon. So I was able to compose my luminous object because I highlighted here in this video three of the works that I developed for the show um, to give this idea of a body of works that relates to the same experience of living there for five ish six years. Um, and well, it was just a bunch of great coincidences that uh, when you stay in for enough time in a place and you accept to engage with community and then they start to allow the space to unfold to you. Um, this only happened because of the time I stayed there and how generous people were uh, with me there. I'm really grateful for them, to my friends there in Urubu. Yeah, well, that's the process, I would say. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Alexa Velez, and I am a multimedia artist who works with dance, video, sound, and music. Uh, and my inspiration for the piece with a lot of my work, I like transforming ordinary spaces into theatrical settings for storytelling. I like to use video to kind of transform these spaces through dance. Dance is a medium that I consider uh, a different kind of dialogue that engages with space, um, especially familiar spaces. Um, and so with this piece, uh, it was inspired by, I guess, my annoyance with this air conditioner that was sort of 
taking over the space because whenever I have it running, the sound was just like overwhelming. And I was like, how do we live like this? Um, and uh, was kind of became fixated on this machine and uh, was interested in how, you know, as humans, we kind of think we can control the elements. You know, we turn on the tap and the water flows immediately. We turn on an air conditioner and the air, we can control the temperature and the flow of the current. Um, but on a larger scale, like with hurricanes and tornadoes, we're kind of at the mercy of these elements. And we just kind of forget that in these interior spaces that we live in every day, because these spaces are devoid of nature. They're these perfect, pristine spaces that we kind of control, like we're gods in a way. And so with this piece, I was um, really determined to create a duet between the body and the air, and where the air is this manipulative force. Um, and sort of controlling the body and kind of taking back some of that control uh, in that way. Uh, and that's my inspiration. Cool. Um, so my name's Doug. Uh, my piece was the first one that was shown, and its title is Last Gesture. And I think my main inspiration for this comes from my background going, growing up in a relatively conservative community where I could see people rally around local socio-ecological issues that directly affected them. And I grew up in the um, Inconvenient Truth era, you know, where we were shown all these images of polar bears on ice caps and stuff like that, and it, it didn't resonate with a lot of people surrounding me. And I think that a lot of the people around me just didn't believe in climate change for a really long time. And I think it's really important, like, as Congressman pointed out, that a lot of people have started to come around, but I think that as young artists, our next step is to inspire local action and um, bring communities together around solutions to socio-ecological issues that feed the bigger climate change problems. And I think you'll notice all three of us um, spoke about specific places that were important to us. And I think that that's a lot of what this next generation of artists is focused on, so. Thank you, Doug, and thank you all of you for your beautiful work, and I'm thrilled that we were able to sort of premiere it on a, on a scale here. Um, there's a lot of meat in what we've been talking about for the last hour and a half, so, um, so I know that there are questions both in the room and also uh, through the live streaming. So I think we should open it up, rather than me asking questions, we should open it up to the room and also Nehemiah, it, who is who's sort of scoping out the questions in the ether if there are any that you want to illuminate for us here. So um, maybe we bring the house lights up a bit and, uh, and see if there are any questions in the room. And I think there are mics available. I see Nehemiah is Lauren are working on Test, that. test, okay. okay. All right. Uh, we'd like to start um, with a question we have about the exhibition spaces of coal and ice. How intriguing that you have an underground parking lot and Fort Mason in San Francisco and a tent in Washington, D.C. Could you explain how you choose your partnering organizations and these wonderful exhibition uh, spaces? Well, that's a great question. I really want Orville to respond. It's whoever comes forward. We've really seen this as an, partners are open invitations. Can you be flexible enough to take what's offered and transform it in a way that's still coherent with as large a concept as you have? You know, it's compromise, the art of compromise. And I'll be interested in all of the three of you, how you think about that. You know, opportunities open up. I once, I have a funny association, flying with a pilot on a very gray, over Long Island actually, totally cloudy couldn't see the field below and that sweat starts to form and you have this anxiety, this is it. And suddenly there's a little opening, a spot of blue and he knew exactly what to do. And he just dove down and landed. So I think of that metaphorically, the offering, the opportunity, we've already had conversations this morning, dreaming dreams. Yes, you might start, shall I dare say, would we like to be at the time of the United Nations in the fall in Central Park? Or, or could we get Bryant Park? What's the centerpiece to bring in the conversation, to be as inclusive as we can be? You can dream, and then somebody says, well, what about this? And I think anyone as an artist, you dive in and you say, what can I do 
to make this happen? With whom? Who's willing? Who's with us? And you build the partnerships. I mean, that's the magic. Thank you. Anyone? Yes. Uh, I think there's a mic coming. Thanks, Julia. Uh, for uh, Mr. Ross, I guess when um, you were taking the pictures of the waves, just the immensity of it, and like I saw the video how you were taking it, it looks like you're incredibly close to it. I mean, just feeling that and the, the fear of it and just the majesty of it, um, I guess what were you going through when you were taking that? Hmm. Um, one thing is I'm certainly not thinking. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, I am a, not a particularly brave person, honestly. Um, you know, pain, uh, uh, exhaustion, all sorts of things can be frightening to me. But um, as a child, I uh, spent time by the ocean, and I was riveted, I think, by my fear. Um, I was, you know, little. The waves were, even if they were five feet tall, they were bigger than me. And I was constantly being dumped. So from, you know, I think part of what drove me into this subject was some residue, some memory. When I'm working in the ocean, um, so it was interesting watching uh, one of our winners here uh, uh, and her dance, and I couldn't help but think, I was so aware of the dance relative to air and so on. And, and I am dancing relative to the ocean. And so, you know, it's been a, uh, a journey for me where I go in. In the old days, I'd have to get out within five minutes because I had to change the film in my camera. Now I can go in and stay in there ridiculously until I'm exhausted. I'm really thinking. I'm in a, uh, it's in a flow state. And I don't mean flow in the sense of that, that ocean, but internal. And it's really after, and, and the discussion I had with Orville I mentioned back in 2014 or something, I, I really am not somebody who is consciously making uh, a journalistic or a commentary, uh, uh, some sort of piece of art like that. But what's happened is that after I'm in that ocean and I've become so aware of what's going on, the images I'm drawing out of the ocean have a new drama to them. And um, I'm actually going to be going in, uh, I guess, December, to a place called Nazare in Portugal. And those are the largest waves in the world. They're, they can get 80 to 100 feet. And um, I think I want to test the boundaries of what I can do, because I think that the, the thing we're all dealing with, those of us in this room, um, you know, the immensity of nature is one thing, but it seems that we have this horrifying capacity to destroy it. And the, at the end of the day, if any of you have seen uh, the Attenborough, that last Tenth Testament movie, which is so remarkable, and I was listening to the congressman, and you gave me hope listening to you, and so did Attenborough. And so no matter how big we think we are, you know, nature will win. We just have to harness ourselves like indigenous people, like the Native Americans that came before us, and pay attention to that immensity. So I'm like this big in that ocean, and I just feel grateful for it. Thank you. Uh, in the middle of the room, I guess, oh, is that Wendy? Yeah. Hi. Um, question for the artist. How did you even find out about this competition? Um, well, was... How did I find out about the competition? Wow, Creative Capital website, actually. <laughs> Google. I had a great local arts coordinator share it with me. And this, I should say, is the inaugural year. And it also comes with a, a very nice prize. So, and a trip to Washington to be with us. So, <laughs> so thank, you for, thank you, Frankenthaler Foundation. Way in the back there.
Let's see if we. Oh, great. Hello. Um, for many long term residents in the area, uh, Congressman, we you know, know of Don Bayer Auto. And I just wonder what are the challenges of, I don't know what connection you still have with the dealership or whether your family does, but what are the challenges of your great environmental message, but also um, being so long connected with the dealership? And what can auto dealerships do to influence environmental policy in terms of, um, you know, gas consumption and, um, you know, shifting to electric vehicles? Uh, well, ha happily, I, I sold that to my brother two and a half years ago. And I'll explain why in just a second. Um, happily, last year, with a, a lot of conversation with the Virginia Auto Dealers Association, Virginia became the second state after California to commit to zero emission vehicles by 2030. Um, and the heart, usually the car dealers are the opposition to that, um, but we got them all on board. Um, so we're moving in the right direction. Um, the, I think most car dealers right now are in the position of uh, excited about the electrification of the vehicles. Um, it presents interesting challenges, though. The typical, this may be apocryphal, but it's on Google. Uh, the typical internal combustion engine drivetrain has 20,000 parts. An electric vehicle drivetrain has 20 parts. It's an 1,000 to 1 uh, impact. So that changes the business model completely, because you generally, uh, it's tough to make money selling a car. You make all your money on parts and service. What happens when there's no parts and service? Um, which is why I sold to my brother. <laughs> in, in any case, we, we want to try to push the manufacturers uh, to, to move in the environmentally healthy direction and then do everything that we can. And, and full disclaimer, I'm a, I'm a proud Don Bayer Volvo owner <laughs> multiple times. Uh, but while, while you have the mic, Congressman, I just want to ask a question. You're a congressman representing an urban suburban area. So, so my question to you is how do you best deal with uh, environmental issues while balancing the needs of an urban, suburban constituents? Uh, and, um, and, and what's the balance? I know you're both a national leader and a local leader. Yeah, I, I don't find that the balance is difficult at all. Um, the harder part is trying to get people that are um, focused on the short term to get interested in the long term. Um, yeah, and it's easier with the kids. I mean, the younger people, the under 30, under 35, are good on almost every issue uh, long term, but the ones that are my age are like uh, not so much. Uh, so trying to bring people along and think about, you know, the, the whole idea that the, my dad was a NASCAR racer. He used to say the difference between the good drivers and the expert drivers is the expert drivers look farther down the road. Um, and that's what we need to do with our citizenry. By the way, I had one question for our wonderful artist here. Who was on the other end of that rope? That's my question, too. And how was it anchored? Yeah. <laughs> I, that's a great question. Um, I try to find somebody I trust. <laughs> I try to find somebody who is hefty and strong. Um, and I try to find somebody who's willing to get wet. Um, it's such a funny question. I've never been asked it before. But yeah, I have, um, and in the beginning, there was no rope, there was no wetsuit, and there was no flotation vest. I was just plain stupid. The, the question earlier about this, I uh, was up in Westchester. It's about a three-hour drive to uh, uh, this little piece of beach that I share with Susan. It's kind of wonderful. And I, I, I had borrowed a camera from a friend of mine, and... Uh, I saw on the news that there was, you know, hurricane offshore, and I thought, boy, that sounds like a pretty good subject, that impulse. And it took, you know, several years for me to realize how stupid I was. And I was, this is terrible, like a true confession here. I should lie down on the couch. I actually was so stupid that I wore fishing waders with a belt because I thought, well, it'll be cold, and, you know. And it only dawned on me a little bit later that, you know, the water goes in and the career is gone. Uh, so um, there are all sorts of, <laughs> anyway, yeah, thanks for that question. <laughs> uh, there, I promise the gent in the middle in the, in the bluish shirt, and then we'll come back up front. I have a question for Doug. 
It's a two-part question, if you don't mind. Uh, the first one is I really like the reversed images that you had in your short film. And to me, it was very um, hopeful that what if, you know, the, uh, the smoke would come back to the factory, the smoke, the, uh, yeah, the smoke would come back to the factory, and if, what if the rocks go back to the hill and all that. Uh, to me, it's very uh, hopeful, very powerful images. And uh, I was wondering if you had the same thoughts uh, when you shot those, when you reversed the, image, reversed the images. And the second part is, you said you come from a conservative um, state, conservative uh, area. And I was wondering what it was like for you to grow up with uh, possibly having peers and friends having the opposite views of what you have about the environment. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Um, so to answer the first part, I definitely, I think there's a lot of hope in um, finding ways to, you know, literally pull carbon back into, um, back out of the atmosphere. I do find a lot of hope in that, and maybe subconsciously that image was, you know, that image of that was um, reflecting that for sure. Um, and then growing up in a relatively conservative area and then kind of coming to, to terms with understanding that I, I believe in the human cause climate crisis and I believe that it's our job to fix what ourselves and the generations before us um, caused. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it was definitely a, a shift, but I, I do think that um, it's really important for someone like me and other people like me who come from that background to maintain a foot on both sides. And right now there's certainly a wedge between um, our political binary that we have, and I, I think it's really important for people to um, actively speak to both sides without trying to convince and listen. And I, I think that listening and speaking when you're supposed to speak is, is really important right now. So. And, and while we're on the subject of hope, and I'll get to, there was a hand somewhere in yeah, Andras, in just a sec. I, I, while we're speaking of hope, Felice, I just wanted to ask you as the person who's every day looking at all of the sort of scary data, what gives you hope in this moment? Well, first of all, knowing that we have members of Congress like one, like you up in, uh, in Cap on Capitol Hill um, gives me hope. And I would say, you know, if you look, there's solutions all around us uh, that can reverse the threats of climate change. And uh, what gives me hope is seeing that we are making progress. So yes, it's innovating uh, the things that we've talked about of direct air capture and grabbing carbon out of the atmosphere. But it's also about the charging stations that you mentioned. We worked really hard to get that bill over the finish line um, uh, because we do need to uh, begin to electrify our transportation sector. And those are things that if you look 10 years ago, they were nowhere, nowhere. Imagine where we're gonna be in 10 years. So yesterday, or the day before, there was a major uh, announcement on weatherization. And we sit and we think, oh, weatherization, you know, your air conditioner. Weatherization, you might think, why is that a solution to climate change? It is absolutely a solution to climate change. This is a way that you can make your homes more energy efficient, then you're using less energy, then you're emitting less carbon. All of these things, they seem like very small, but think about a puzzle all of them actually do play a part in addressing the problem. And so my job is every day instilling hope in people because what we want to do is continue to, to make progress and convince lawmakers that these are the right votes to take. We have your back when you take those votes and, and continue to inspire people to vote for people who care about these issues. And I could not agree more. It's not about Republicans or Democrats or independents. We have a lot of, of of issues that we that we we care about, uh, where we have common interests, and our job is to to work around those those areas of common interests. Great, thank you, Andras. Uh, well, first of all, I'd, I'd like to really again commend you, the artists, the three young art, so-called young artists, uh, for these works, which um, I think also illustrate that artists have a unique toolkit. Art is not propaganda. Art is not journalism. There are wonderful journalistic ways of doing work, but you are artists. And in fact, there's a very interesting discussion at the jury meeting about the light pollution and how does that relate to climate change. But as we thought about the work, 
we really thought it was a beautiful uh, meditation really on the impact of humanity on our environment in a larger way, more metaphorical way. Why am I saying this? I'm very curious for each of you, first of all, if you could mention which school you're connected to and to what degree does this set of issues come up in your curriculum or whether you're sort of going out on your own dealing with this or how in an art school today in 2021, 20, 22, uh, do the, this subject matter get communicated or taught or explained? Um, and if you could just reflect on that briefly. Um, certainly, so uh, I'm a student at the University of Utah. Um, I'm uh, also in the Global Changes and Sustainability Center there. And um, aside from our curriculum, I am fortunate to every week hear from a different researcher doing work on air quality and um, other socio-ecological issues that directly face Salt Lake City. And what that does in turn is let me use a quote by Brian Eno, science, di or science discovers and art digests. And so to me, it's along with doing direct action related to these, um, to these socio-ecological issues, I think that art has a very distinct power to distill and digest that into something that may directly speak, um, may directly speak to the populace like Orville's um, show coal and ice speaks directly like this is the problem this is the solution here's what's causing it but i think art also can um like the work of our generation start to dive into the nuances and instead of telling asking questions so artwork which creates a space where the viewer asks questions and comes to their own solutions to those questions and i think we're starting to see a lot more of that I graduated, hello? Oh, okay. I graduated from Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, um, and I started making work about climate uh, change as a result of growing up in Florida and witnessing all these hurricanes and things and happening in my backyard. Um, and yeah, a lot of the work that I do is a result of me sort of thinking about this constantly and digesting it and kind of like vomiting it through my work. And this is all the questions that I'm thinking and our relationships with our spaces and how do I sort of transform or create a different kind of dialogue with that space um, to just maybe just ask people to question how we've been doing things a little bit. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm going to split my answer in two because first, uh, my experience in Brasilia, I guess I was driven to this uh, themes, the subject, um, kind of intuitively, but also because experiencing the, the, the city being expanded because Brasilia was a city built by scratch, from scratch, and uh, um, I was growing there and seeing like every year a new building a new something and i was watching this expansion of the city and then i decided to move to the border of in a in a sort of a reserve air reserve area but um and uh to watch the expansion and also that this relation with the night uh uh it's also like uh, strategy that relates to that because I was like looking for luminous objects as traces of this expansion and I was like reimagining a counter reaction and counter expansion of like how the savannas the forest could uh, go against the expansion of the city um, so and then I moved to Chicago uh, last year uh, the, my first year in SAIC was online because of the pandemic, and then I moved to there, like fearing death, fearing everything. That uh, was like a traumatized experience to move during the pandemic. Um, and was in a while, um, uh, the first time I am living in a big city. Um, and uh, and 
I had to dig to find my peers there in that sense. Like we have a bunch of nature and post-humanistic classes, but it's not clear because it's like it's super, it's super big. We have a, tons of classes being offered. Uh, and I had to, like being in person, I, I, just, I was just seeking for my common ground uh, uh, with people. Um, and uh, overall, my experience in Brazil or in here is like sometimes I feel just like stigmatized. Applying for a show, applying for a collective exhibition is like uh, we are like talking about a subject that um, usually, I don't know, most of artists are not talking about. Is It's so much easier to be accepted in, in those venues that relates directly to climate, so basically it's not centered as should be. Um, uh, anyway, but it's changing, like, because we are demanding this as well as artists. Like, I feel that my work, doing experimental works, relates to that. Like, to talk about this uh, also asks me to, to, do, to challenge my practice, like doing experimental work. So I, I would say it's like, it's a way of saying something that was not uh, say in a usual way before, I don't know. Uh, anyway, but just to finish, I, just, I know I'm taking too long, but in Brazil it's more common um, that this is most be this team, this discussion is most being carried by indigenous artists. Uh, so, uh, and anyway, this is also a background that was nourishing me before, like exchanging with them. Thank you. And I think we just have time for one question, but I want to be conscious of the folks that may be having questions from the live stream and sensitive to that room, that larger room out there. So I'm not sure, Nehemiah, while you're looking, well, I'll take I'll take your question in the middle of the room there, well, because Nehemiah has to go back and look at the website. This is a, a simple but really hard question with short answers. I, I, and it's mostly for our three award winners and for Congressman Beyer. 30 years ago, I was working with Senator Gore, and we did 30 hearings on climate change and ozone depletion. And I learned that no matter how good my briefing memo, what really changed people's minds and challenged their mindsets was an image. Mm -hmm. Not a video, a painting, a photo, a graph. So for the three of you and anybody else who wants to answer, is there one image you'd like to show and burn into the brain of our business leaders and politicians? An image that we haven't seen, not the polar bear, is there something that you'd point us to that could actually change the conversation? And, and I'll, before I'll pass it on, I just want to say, if you haven't seen Coal and Ice, that is what the show is about. So, so there are many images there that you will never well, be able to Well, I'm asking for the image. Uh, my image is an image I want to be able to take in my life. I want to be able to take an image of a full Great Salt Lake. I'll come back to this question. I would say, I don't know how the image will, would look like, but would be an image that could say at the same time that uh, climate justice, racial justice, gender justice should, and multi-species justice should all come together. Um, so to repeat your question, an image that is burned in my mind or an image? Hmm. This is an image um, by an artist that the name escapes my mind, but it's an image of a tree uprooted, and it's really the sound that's burned into my head. It's the sound of like the roots sort of uh, dripping water into a lake, and it is an image that, you know, you listen to it, and it's really meditative, but then you keep listening to it, and it sounds like the tree is crying. And that image has just stayed with me. And I'm so sorry, I cannot remember the name of this artist because she's a phenomenal artist. Um, but that image is burned into me. But it's not really the image, it's the sound that comes with it. Well, I, I have one, uh, I have two ways that I would answer that question. First of all, all politics are local. 
So there is no one image. So I worked at National Wildlife Federation for 15 years, and we had a lot of images on polar bears. And that moved a lot of people and inspired a lot of people, but it also did not, did not move and inspire a lot of lawmakers uh, and get them to, 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 uh, to advance progress. So what I've learned over the years is we can't overlook imagery that resonates locally. So if it's, uh, if it's flooding in Arlington, if it's, um, if it's beach erosion in Maryland, which is where I live, if it's the impact that it's having on the fisheries and the lobster off the coast of Maine where I spent half my childhood, we just, ha you have it, we just can't leapfrog the importance of finding imagery that's local. And then uh, the one thing I would say that really, um, that really resonated with me, and I think it resonated, and I would be curious, Congressman, if, if it resonated with your colleagues up and down the eastern seaboard, is this uh, it was something that was, uh, the New York Times did a huge spread on it. It was called the Sunny Day Floods. And until that point, everybody just thought of flooding as something that happens after a storm. And the New York Times went up and down the eastern seaboard, really from, from Florida, I think actually all the way up to, up to Virginia. I don't think they went further north. And discovered that you didn't need a storm. Streets were flooded. And they were flooded when the sun was out, day after day after day. Uh, and that was one, I think, that really began to, to open people's minds. I agree with Felice completely on the... All politics is local, but if there's one local image that um, is the most powerful for me, it's all the fires. And, and not just in the forest, but in the suburbs of Denver and in California and the like. So, or or the, the asphalt melting in Portland, Oregon. I just remember the name of the artist, Dana Levy. And the image stays in my brain because it's something that's very soothing, but the message underneath is very alarming. So I think mm. those two together is why. Again, on the message of hope, yeah. that, that's what is the way. Thanks, Alexa. And I think it's a beautiful way to end is by all of these images in our heads because that's what this whole gathering is all about. So I want to thank this enormous panel for being, and, the, and the very patient audience for really just such a powerful gathering. So thank you. Thank you.